Good morning. Merry Christmas to everybody. Praise God. Glad to see you all here. Shall we all arise? It's so wonderful to be in the house of God. Father, we thank you for everything that you have done. The year is almost over and your goodness has never changed. Oh God, we just want to praise you, Lord. We come, oh God, to not only receive your word, but to Seeing that you are worthy, oh God, you're worthy, you are always worthy of our praise, oh God, for all that you are, not just for the things that you do, but for all that you are. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you come and fill this place. Would you come and fill this place and let us experience your touch this morning, oh God, even as we listen to your word. We expect that you would do a great thing in our midst, oh God, because that is who you are. That is how awesome you are. That is how awesome you are. You are good, Lord God. You are good. And we praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we come today. Amen. Hallelujah. There's a reason to celebrate every day. and all that's above praise him you angels in heaven Voices as we sing, great in power. 
presence is our heaven, oh God. Your presence is our heaven, Lord God, here on earth. Satisfies, oh God. Sing, who is like you, Lord? like you, Lord. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty in this world. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence and your presence is heaven to me. Your presence is heaven to me.
Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Nothing in this world. And nothing in this world could satisfy. Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Jesus, you're the cup. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry.
God, we are here today. And we are not ashamed, O Lord. We are not afraid to worship you. We are not ashamed to worship you. We are here to honor you, O God, from our hearts. People of God today, when you come before the throne of the Lord, you bring everything. You bring everything. From what is inside, you bring it out to the Lord. Let us fill our hearts today with worship. Let us fill our hearts today with adoration of our God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. One more time, let us just lift up our hands and say hallelujah. 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 Father, today we just want to thank you and want to glorify your name. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Nobody deserves to be in your presence, but we thank you, Jesus, for your blood that shed on the cross of Calvary for us, that made us worthy to come before the throne of God, before the throne of the Holy God. We cover ourselves right now with the blood of Jesus. And by your grace, Lord, we come into the presence of our God. We thank you for your goodness to us today. Thank you for gathering us here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we give a clap offering to the Lord? And let us all be seated. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. It seems that our line outside is um, long. Okay, that's because... They came in <laughs> late. <laughs> okay, that's just the reason. You will be trapped in the line when you come late. All right? But if I believe if you came here at 9 a.m., hindi ka siguro na trapped. All right? Once again, good morning to everyone. And also, good morning to all our brothers and sisters who are watching live stream. Also, Pastor Tony and Pastor Lily, good morning to everyone. Good morning to you. I believe we are here, uh, all here excited to be found in the house of God. Let us always fill our hearts with expectation from our God. Let me give you our announcement for today or and for this week. Please remember that this afternoon will be our second Ilongo service at 2 p.m. As I said, please come early so you won't be late or you won't be trapped in our uh, health protocol area and if you want to pay your faith pledge all right please go and see bro brother joel or pastor yoli and as you pay please uh, claim a receipt from them okay and then of course this coming tuesday this will be our last midweek discipleship service for the year 2020 so i so i would like to encourage all the dj cell groups and members to join us this coming tuesday at 6 to 7 30. it will be a time of praise and worship a time of dj cell group and a time for corporate prayer join us for our midweek discipleship service and of course the long awaited okay the the most exciting of all is our simple christmas celebration here at etab we call it regardless so that will be on december 24 at 10 a.m as i said when we come to the house of god we come 
early. If you come here at 10, I want to tell you there will be 180 of us on that day. 180. If, you, if 180 of you comes at 10 a.m., I tell you we will have a service with 10 people inside because all of you will be found outside. So please come early, okay? Considering that there is still our health protocol. So please come very early. If you can come at 9, please come at 9 because we will start the service at 10 a.m. Maybe I will lock the door at 10. <laughs> okay, just joking. So please come early, December 24 at 10 a.m., but please come at 8.30 or 9 a.m. So we will not be trapped outside. Are you here? Are you here? Uh, you know, sometimes I wonder kung nagapamati gimang kita or not because sometimes if I speak, though nagawonder ako kung na iban ga listen because they still continue to do their things. So please remember, come very early this coming Thursday, December 24, for, is it Thursday? Yes, Thursday. December 24 for our regardless at 10 a.m. Okay? So, uh, and of course, next Sunday, we still have two services because it's not yet New Year. It's far from December 31. So we still have two services next Sunday, but that will be our Thanksgiving service. Okay, there will be a sharing, a, thanks, a sharing on Thanksgiving and a time of giving thanks to the Lord through our praise and worship. So please come at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. All right? So I believe we understand uh, about our announcement. And of course, uh, the two weeks from now, we are going to have our New Year service. That's, that is actually our first service for the year 2021. So we would like to encourage you all. Join us every Sunday. I will give you a complete announcement next Sunday for the next year or next year program. Okay? I believe that today we all came here ready to give to the Lord. Shall we prepare our hearts and shall we pray as we prepare our tithes and offerings? Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We want to bless you and honor you by our giving. We ask, O oh God, that Lord, you will bless the givers and bless our tithes and offerings in Jesus name we pray Amen again good morning to all of you i would like to make it clear to all the leaders of this church as leaders you must come early to the house of god okay don't come the latest don't come later than your members because we are leaders okay so uh, we cannot do it again and to those who have been coming early God bless you. But for those who have been coming late, please uh, come early, especially when you are a leader of this church. Are you angry? <laughs> Will you forgive me for saying that? Patawaron nyo ko? Okay, sige. Well, kung hindi nyo ko pagpatawaron, makonvict gid ka mo karanto kayo. If you have your Bibles, 
kindly turn with me to Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 to verse 21. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15 to 21. If you don't know where's, where Genesis is, it's the first book of the Bible. Okay, the first book, the Old Testament, or the first book of the entire Bible. Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter of Genesis, verse 15 to 21. I will read to you, and we also have on our screen. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did, what that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell, before, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Another verse Another text found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that, God, we can always listen to your word. Your word can really convict us, but the Holy Spirit will, give, will bring changes into our hearts. So help me, Lord God, to just have the clear mind and a clear speech and we ask the Holy Spirit to just convict us and bring changes into our hearts today. Anoint me, O God, as I share in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible clearly tells us that we must forgive our debtors so that we may not be disqualified from God's forgiveness. Many people are hurting, angry, bearing grudges, keeping malice, backbiting, and walking in bitterness because they have been offended by someone. They have made statements like, I will never forgive over my dead body and many more. In my last sermon, last November, I shared with you that I was very angry with my dad for the hurts he caused my mom. My anger worsened into bitterness that I didn't want to see him, and even if he died, I will not visit his wake. I could not forgive my dad. But forgiveness is a character trait of God. Daniel chapter 9, verse 9 tells us, To the Lord our God belongs mercy and, forgive, and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. From the time of Adam, man has lived in rebellion to the Almighty God. Yet, because of His mercies, God has always pardoned our sin. 1 John 1, 8, 9 tells us, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Forgive. This word forgive is a big word. It is huge gigantic. Just seven letters. F-O-R-G-I-V-E. Seven letters only. But it is something that takes years to learn how to do well. And more than learning how to do it, it takes the grace of God. Around us, you will see a lot of ugliness in life from an unwilling to forgive. From an unwillingness to forgive. Many people can tell us stories of family feuds. Often, money is the center. We hear of problems starting between family members who fight over the estate money after parents die. Or family members in business together get jealous of one another, 
start fighting over money or control, and, even, and, and before long, they are no longer talking. It may even come to lawsuits against one another. We know examples of that is the series liner and this grace pharmacy. They are fighting among themselves. They are families, brother and sister against parents. A lack of trust and inability to forgive does huge damage. When we cannot work or won't forgive each other, relationships are destroyed more and more as time passes. Husbands and wives who won't forgive find the marriage drifting apart more and more. They might live under the same roof, but there is no love. There's hardly communication. And when they do communicate, it's usually more fuel on the fire. There's no good will between them. No willingness to give their spouse the benefit of the doubt. Words and actions are misunderstood and the meaning twisted. In most cases, the marriage eventually ends because none of us can live under such intense pressure for a long time. People who won't forgive wrongs done in the workplace grow increasingly bitter. They resent the employee or employer who wronged them. And that grows into bitterness that clouds our vision we cannot, so we can't be objective anymore. We see nothing but negative things in our workplace. And eventually, we either quit or get fired because our attitude is so toxic and our work quality suffers. This happens to many of our workers. They always complain, this work is so difficult. My boss is so difficult. That's why they quit. Is it any wonder that God tells His people to forgive one another? He loves us too much that He does not want us to go down the destructive road of forgiveness, of unforgiveness. That's why He gives us a call to forgive. The year is ending soon, and a new beginning will start. Let us start the new year with a, renew, with a renewed heart, with renewed hearts. Today, allow me to share to you on the call to forgive. The call to forgive. I have four points. The meaning of forgiveness, the absence of forgiveness, the price of forgiveness, and Jesus, the full price of forgiveness. First, let us go to my first point, the meaning of forgiveness. According to Wikipedia, forgiveness is the intentional and voluntary process by which a victim undergoes a change in feelings and attitude regarding an offense and overcomes negative emotions such as resentment and vengeance. Psychologists generally define forgiveness as a conscious, deliberate decision to release feelings of resentment or vengeance toward a person or group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve your forgiveness. And there are three types of forgiveness according to psychologists. Number one, the exoneration. This is what we generally have in mind when we think of the word forgiveness. Exoneration essentially means that the slate is completely wiped clean and the relationship is fully restored to its previous sense of innocence. Basically, exoneration means forgive and forget, as the old saying goes. When you exonerate someone, it's as if the, harm, the harmful action never took place at all. Daw sa wala lang. This is a wow. I harm you, but when I say sorry, it's like nothing happened. Second type of forgiveness, forbearance. This second level of forgiveness applies when an offender either makes a partial apology or lessens their apology by suggesting that you are also, also partially to blame for their wrongdoing. May salakaman mo. That is why nagamu ko na. They may even explicitly state that you did something to cause them to behave badly. 
While an apology may in fact be offered here, it's usually not what was hoped for and may feel inauthentic. Like for example, we, we hear people say, I am sorry you feel that way. Or we hear, I did, if I did anything to upset you, I'm sorry. Kung sa aton pabla, ti kung nakasala giman ko, sorry. Kagdamo sa aton, okay, nag-sorry ka na. That is forbearance. You forgive by forbearance. But the apology is not really complete. Do you understand? This is also similar to forgive but don't forget. Trust but verify. With forbearance, you are able to continue relationships with people who are important to you but who may not be fully trustworthy. You may not be close to him or her anymore. Third type is we call release. Release is a third level of forgiveness and applies to situations in which the person who hurt you has never acknowledged any wrongdoing. He or she has either never apologized or has offered an incomplete or insincere apology. Sorry, Lada. Or never at all. Apology or not, no reparations have been given and the perpetrator or the offender has done little or nothing to improve the relationship. So you have to release na lang. Since wala ka man nag-sorry, so I will release you. But I will not talk to you. Nothing at all. Like for example, the survivors of child abuse. Like we have a center here, Chameleon. Where children or the girls were raped. And the perpetrators are still at large until today. They did not, those perpetrators, they did not admit their crimes. And so those children are so pitiful that they have to force themselves to just release. But frankly, how can they forget the crime done against them? Another example is, this is very cute. Pastor Carlin always go to pedicurist. One day she went for a pedicure, but by a different pedicurist. The, the old one was a very good one, but this one, this new one, was from another parlor. She was terrible. She just dug and dug Pastor Carlin's toenail as if she was digging patatas. <laughs> Sweet potato. So Pastor Carlin told her, please do it properly by using nippers because it was very painful. But do you know what she replied, Pastor Carlin? She said, what can I do? There are no more two nails. Wala na kuko. Ano pang kutkuton ko? There was no apology at all. And Pastor Carlin used release type of forgiveness. There was no apology at all. So he just release you. So when speaking of forgiveness, Jesus uses the image of debts, utang, to describe the nature of sins. Matthew 6.12 tells us, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And on the parable of the unmerciful servant in Matthew 18, 21 to 23, it talks about forgiveness, debts as forgiveness or forgiveness as debts. When someone seriously wrongs you, there is an absolutely unavoidable sense that the wrongdoer owes you. May utang siya sa imo, kay may sala siya sa imo. The wrong has incurred an obligation, a liability, a debt. Anyone who has been wronged feels a compulsion to make the other person pay that debt. We do that by hurting them, yelling at them, making them feel bad in some way, or just waiting and watching and hoping that something bad happens to them. Only after we see them suffer in some proportionate way, do we see that the debt has been paid and the sense of obligation is gone? This sense of debt or liability and obligation is impossible to escape. When there is offense, when there is wrongdoing, there will always be debt and liabilities. Anyone who denies it exists. Anyone who denies it exists has simply not been wronged or sinned against in any serious way. 
what then is forgiveness? Forgiveness means giving up the right to seek repayment from the one who harmed you. It is a form of voluntary suffering. What does that mean? Voluntary suffering. What, is, what do you mean by voluntary suffering? For example, if somebody breaks my window glass, and if the glass costs 5,000 pesos to replace, then the act of glass breaking incurs a debt of 5,000 pesos. He must pay me 5,000 pesos. If I let him pay for and replace the glass, I get my window back, and he is out 5 pesos. Nagastuhan siya 5,000 pesos. But if I forgive him for what he did, the debt does not somehow vanish into the air. It means if I forgive him, hindi ka magsilinga, wala na tong tanan. Something still is happening in the air. Something is still there. When I forgive him, I absorb the cost and payment for the window. Ako yan na malayran. Either I will pay the 5,000 to replace, to replace it or I will lose the glass. That is what we call voluntary suffering or pain. When you forgive, there is always voluntary suffering or pain. To forgive is to cancel a debt by paying it or absorbing it yourself. Someone always pays every debt. This is the case in all situations of wrongdoing. Even when no money is involved, when you are sinned against, you lose something. Perhaps happiness, reputation, peace of mind, a relationship, or an opportunity. There are two things to do about a sin. You can try to restore it by paying the other person back, voicing public criticisms and ruining his or her reputation, or you can forgive the one who wronged you, refuse payback, and absorb the damage to your reputation. In all cases, when wrong is done, there is a debt. And there is no way to deal with it without suffering. Either you make the perpetrator or the wrongdoer suffer for it, or you forgive and suffer for it yourself. Forgiveness is always extremely costly. It is emotionally very expensive. And when you forgive, you pay the debt yourself in several ways. First, you refuse to hurt the person directly. When you forgive, you don't want to hurt that person directly anymore. You don't want vengeance anymore. Hindi ka na manukot. Hindi ka na magpasakit sa iya. Instead, you are as cordial as possible. Second, you refuse to employ insinuation or spin or hint or gossip or direct slander to diminish those who have hurt you in the eyes of others. Wala mo na sila ginapakalain sa iban. Sometimes we go to this person and we say, I just want to express my, 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 what, I, what I feel. I just want to express my hurt with you. But actually, you are talking bad against that person, to that person. When you forgive, you don't do that. Third, when forgiving, you refuse to, in, refuse to indulge in ill will in your heart. That means you don't malign or demonize the offender in your imagination. Sometimes we think they are devils, they are demons. Don't root for them to fail. Don't hope for their pain. See, these, these are the three things that we have to pay ourselves when we forgive. It is so difficult to practice forgiveness, forgiveness, really. But our second point tells us about the absence of forgiveness. It is difficult to forgive, to forgive. But when there is an absence of forgiveness, what happens? Hating someone, holding an offense, or harboring a grudge against a grudge causes many negative effects. Damo negative effects. The person who allows such attitudes in his life becomes miserable. His health suffers as do his relationships. When we don't forgive others, it brings about a bondage to our souls that could be compared to being enslaved by people or bound by a, by a substance addiction. This unforgiveness causes, us a, causes a bitterness within us. It locks in sorrow, anger, and strife and locks out joy, love, and fellowship. 
if we refuse to release our offended feelings, they will eventually control us. We will be in bondage to them as well as in the bondage of sin before God. Sins and forgiveness is death, and death means sin. People sometimes convince themselves that vengeance is justified and that vengeance is sweet. Kanami gidya magtimalos. Kanami sang pamatyag ko kung magbalos ko. But but you will never meet a person who is truly happy and at peace with himself who is also vengeful. Yes, there can be a form of satisfaction in a vengeful act. But it is a sickly form of satisfaction. And there is nothing healthy or life-enhancing about it. Vengeful people live in fear and anxiety. They may adopt a pose and a demeanor of confidence, but they do not tend to sleep well at night. They believe so much in vengeance that they cannot conceive of anyone else not feeling the same way. They are waiting and wondering when those they have harmed will come and do vengeance on them. Also, they, they become anxious about how to protect their fragile ego from, be, from real or imagined harm from others. When we refuse to forgive, we can expect to go through painful consequences. That means when we don't forgive, when there is unforgiveness, there are painful consequences. We will have difficulty dealing with the wrong done to us. Instead of releasing it to the Lord, we will rehearse it again. The offense, see, mabalik-balik ang offense and we relieve the pain. Mabalik-balik ang sakit. And resentment will take root in our heart and mind, allowing bitterness to grow. Next, negativity will begin to affect other areas of our life, such as relationships, emotions, attitudes, and even physical health. Next, feelings of discouragement will rob us of joy and contentment. We may look successful to the world, but deep inside, Christ's peace is absent. Next, a buildup of ill feelings will start damaging our emotional health, which in turn hampers our ability to love others and accept love in return. Eventually, despair will set in. That inner turmoil may become so great that we might frantically resort to drugs, alcohol, affairs, pleasure, or excessive devotion to a career in an effort to find relief. Forgiveness is terribly painful and costly because the offended person literally gives up his right to take revenge or seek just recompense for the damages. No one can restore lost happiness, freedom, reputation, or opportunity. And the economic principle of repaying fourfold can never undo or make up for losses to a person's emotional or physical well-being. Sometimes, we resort to legal action. But legal action will at, legal action will at best provide economic relief. But no court action can make the damage go away. When somebody offends you and you bring him to court, no court action can take away the damage. Vengeance does not set the record straight. Two wrongs do not make a right. Rather than making the evil disappear, revenge just causes evil to spread from the perpetrator to the offended. Tragically, damaging their character and sending out waves of bitterness and anger that will impact those who are closest to them and whom they have most, they love most dearly. Now, we know the danger. We know that God wants us to forgive and we know the dangers of the absence of forgiveness. But why is it so difficult to forgive someone who wronged us? Why is it difficult to forgive someone who has wronged us? It is because we have this sense of moral superiority. It's very difficult for us to forgive those who sin against us because we have this moral superiority. We think 
that we are superior or higher than them. This unforgiving attitude is a result of a, of a proud spirit or pride that seeks to keep score and gain revenge for perceived and real wrongs. We always believe we are higher and better than other people, and so nobody should touch us. We tend to second guess. Ginapakot-pakot naton ang motives ng tao. We wonder if they are really sincere. The next time we interact with them, we don't find them any different and certainly not any better. Our minds quickly think, kung sorry to siya, pag, pag forgive ko sa isang last week, kung sorry to siya, dapat subong lain ang ginapakita niya kabatasan. That's us. Tani, may ginhimu man siya nga paagi. He should have tried harder to keep his words nga nagasiling siya. He is sorry. So we quickly second guess the sincerity of others. That's us. We also feel superior and remain unforgiving because we are unaware of our own sinfulness and need for forgiveness. You cannot forgive because you don't think you were forgiven. You forgot naging patawad ka. That's why you, you cannot forgive. When Paul says he is the worst among sinners, he was not exaggerating. He is saying that he is as capable, capable of sin as the worst criminals are. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15 tells us, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul said he is one of the worst sinners. So do we consider that? Consider that. Saturn nga self. So how can we truly forgive? That leads us to my third point, the price of forgiveness. The old saying is true, to forgive is divine. We can only forgive by begging God to do within us what we are not capable of doing for ourselves. God calls us to accept the pain and bear it, which will produce an agonizing sense of death. But death to our own rights is better than a living death of being imprisoned by bitterness. Because denying ourselves the privilege of nursing our hurt will slowly and surely lead to the anger and resentment burning out. And eventually, we will discover within our hearts a rebirth of emotional and spiritual healing, just like spring following winter. To make, to make this clear to us, you may have heard the story of the well-known Cory Ten Boom. This is a story, I want you to listen, how she practiced forgiveness, how she paid the price of forgiveness. She was arrested by the Nazis along with the rest of her family for hiding the Jews in their Harlem home during the Holocaust. She was imprisoned and eventually sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp along with her beloved sister Betsy, who died there just days before Corey's own release on December 31, 1944. Inspired by Betsy's example of selfless love and forgiveness, amid extreme cruelty and persecution, Corey established a post-war home for other camp survivors trying to recover from the horrors they had escaped. She went on to travel widely as a missionary, preaching God's forgiveness and the need for reconciliation. But Corey's Devout moral principles were tested when she came face to face with one of her former tormentors in 1947. After a speech she gave in a church in Germany, a man came to her and said, You mentioned Ravensbrück in your talk. I was a guard in there. But since that time, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, that means lady preacher, 
his hand came out. Will you forgive me? And Corey writes in her story, she said, I stood there. I, whose sins had every day to be forgiven, could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he, this man, erase her slow, terrible death simply by asking me to forgive him? It could have been in many seconds that he stood there, hand held out. But to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with, with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. And still, I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will. She said, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. She prayed, Jesus, help me. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I trust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raised down my arm, sprang into our joined hands. And then, this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I have never known God's love so intensely as I did then. That was the story. True forgiveness is not just saying, I forgive you, as an act of the will. It usually starts that way. But the deep work in our hearts of sincerely forgiving another person, especially if the offense caused great damage, can take years. Why? Tim Keller explains, forgiveness means bearing the cost instead of making the wrongdoer do it. So you can reach out in love to seek the enemy's renewal and change. Forgiveness means absorbing the debts of the sin yourself. Everyone who forgives great evil goes through a death into resurrection and experience nails, blood, sweat, and tears. And that leads me to my fourth and last point. Jesus, the full price of forgiveness. No one who has been deeply wronged just forgives. Kung sa atong pattern, wala sang nasakitan gid nga mahapos magpatawad. If someone wrongs you, there are only two options. One, you make them suffer. Two, re you refuse revenge and forgive them and then you suffer. In the book of Genesis, we are told of, of how Joseph was cruelly treated by his brothers. They cheated him, lied to him, despised him, hurt him, and sold, he, sold him like he was worthless. But when he became the governor of Egypt, and after the death of their father Jacob, everybody thought the day of recompense has come. Everybody thought nag-abot na ang adlaw sa pagpanukot. He had the chance to make his brothers pay back for what they did to him. He had the, the power of for vengeance because he was deeply wrong. But this is what he told them. Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. In order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. It means he forgave them all. But Jesus, 
the greater Joseph came and taught about forgiveness. Seventy times seven, which means we need to forgive someone completely. Jesus showed forgiveness to the woman caught in adultery. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And ultimately, He bore the cost of our wrongdoings on the cross instead of making us do it. He was morally superior and faultless, but the Bible tells us, who being in, in very nature of God, in very nature, God did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. He had power to come down from the cross and condemn us, but He refused revenge. Forgave and endured the mocking of people, the suffering, the crown of thorns, the crucifixion and death on the cross. He was fully aware of our sinfulness and our need of forgiveness. And therefore, He absorbed the debt of sin Himself to pay the full price of forgiveness. On the cross, we see God forgiving us. Jesus cried, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And that was possible only if God suffered. On the cross, God's love satisfied His own justice by suffering, bearing the penalty for sin. There is never forgiveness without suffering, nails, thorns, sweat, and blood. Never. Therefore, since we are crucified with Christ, we no longer live, but Christ lives in us. Since we have received forgiveness by dying with Christ, we can release forgiveness by rising with Him. Romans 6, 4 says, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. This new life includes a life of forgiveness. God led the way in this. Through the death of Jesus, God in flesh, He absorbed the punishment for all the evil and violence and offenses of the world by taking it into himself. Therefore, the God of the Bible is not like the primitive deities who demanded our blood for their wrath to be appeased. Rather, this is a God who becomes human and offers his own life blood in order to honor moral justice and merciful love so that someday he can destroy all evil without destroying us. Tim Keller. In conclusion, do you have anyone in your life who has hurt you terribly? May ara ba lang atawo sa kabuhi ninyo nga nasakitan gid kamo sa iya? Since becoming a Christian, I have always known that God calls us to forgive each other. However, it has taken me many years to understand what true forgiveness looks like and why it is so hard to do. But I want to share my testimony with you. I told you a few weeks ago that I was so bitter with my dad. Do you remember that? That was my three, three ser past sermons. I was so bitter with my dad and I couldn't forgive him. But when I preached a message to you on the melody for the heart, God spoke to me and convicted me. A few days later, I made a decision to go and see him. So, on November 30, that was maybe two or three weeks ago, November 30, which was a holiday, I took a boat to Bacolod City and went to see my dad with my brother, Carrie, who drove his car. When we reached my dad's house, my half-sister welcomed us. And then my dad came out to meet us. We started talking by asking one another about our welfare until I told him about my anger and hurts toward him. And while I was telling him my hurts, he was just there sitting and listening with head bowed. But when I told him, Pang, despite of all the wrongs you did, I forgive you with all my heart.
I choose, I choose not to be angry with you anymore. I release you and I love you. When I said that, I felt God was there mending everything, healing everything. And I could also sense the relief in my dad's, dad's heart. He started to cry. Maybe he knew he was wrong, but had no, had no opportunity to see us and apologize to us. Or maybe he was ashamed of himself. But it was God who led me and my brother who are deeply wrong. We were deeply wrong, but God was the one who led us to see my dad, to see our dad on that day. And good news, my dad received our forgiveness and also received God's forgiveness when I led him to receive Jesus who paid the full price of forgiveness. I led my dad into a sinner's prayer and I led him to accept Jesus in his life. In short, my trip was a victorious one because of forgiveness. For me, my brother, my dad, it was victory for us. And most of all, what happened gave God the glory. Forgiveness gives God the glory. As Tim Keller said, forgiveness means bearing the cost instead of making the wrongdoer do it. He was wrong. My dad was wrong. He should come and apologize to us. But we go, we went and told him. We, I didn't, we didn't ask him, what do you want to say? What do you want to say to us now? No. We just told him, I forgive you. I forgive you. And actually, my dad responded. He was also sorry. Forgiveness be means bringing the cost instead of making the wrongdoer do it. So you can reach out in love to seek your enemy's renewal and change. Because I forgive, my father wanted to change. My dad changed his heart. You cannot be gracious to someone if you are too needy and insecure. If you know God's love and forgiveness, then there is a limit to how deeply another person can hurt you. He or she cannot touch your identity. When you know you are forgiven, nobody can touch your identity. Nobody can touch your wealth. Nobody can touch your significance. And the more you rejoice in your own forgiveness, the quicker you will be to forgive others. When you rejoice that you are forgiven, it will be quicker for us to forgive others. But that's because Jesus paid the full price of forgiveness. Shall we all bow down our heads and let us just close our eyes. Thank you, Lord God. Maybe we will just all stand right now. The Bible tells us, Jesus told us to pray. He said, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Today, we, we come to ask God to forgive us of our sins. But as we come before God to forgive us of our sins, Maybe we remember somebody who hurt us. And right now at this moment, we just need to release that person. If you know that God has forgiven you, please do not be disqualified of that forgiveness. Your unforgiveness, if you don't forgive that person who hurt you, you will be disqualified. Disqualified from the privilege of being forgiven. Father, we come to you right now. And as we come to you, Father, we ask of you, of you that you put someone or a person in our minds, in our hearts. You help us to remember those 
who have wronged us. And because you have forgiven us, we forgive them. We forgive them. The hurt might be so bad, so deep, but we choose to forgive them today. Maybe you, you wonder, brothers and sisters, how? How? How can you forgive? You come to God today, He will empower you to give, to forgive. How to forgive? I said, Jesus will empower you to forgive. As we sing a song, and then we will close in prayer, I just want you to come to the Lord and release forgiveness. Forgiveness to that person. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Yes, God. Because you have forgiven us, Lord. Help us to forgive. From the grace that I found Sing this as your prayer today. Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love hold me close let your love surround time the first stanza lord i come to you oh god let's come to the lord lord i come to you yes god let my heart be changed today let my heart be changed today flowing from the grace that i found I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Oh, hold me close, oh God. Hold me close. Let your love. And as I wait, I'll rise up like the eagle, and I will soar with you. Your spirit leads me on in the power of your love. Oh God, I personally would like to thank you that you have empowered me, oh God, to forgive, to forgive my own dad. And after that, oh Lord, I thank you that I just felt such a, such a release, a liberty, a freedom, and a joy that I let go of that hurt inside me. 
And so, Father, today, you will also do the same to those who have been hurt here today. Let them experience that joy, that release, that freedom from the bondage of unforgiveness. Unforgiveness that locks out joy. Father, today we come to you. As you forgive us, we are willing. We want to forgive. We are determined to forgive those who sin against us. Those who wronged us, we forgive them. We release them. And we will not harbor any bitterness or resentment against them. We will love them. Not just forgive them, but we will love them as you have loved us and forgave us. Father, today, as your people goes out and meet anyone that, Lord, wronged them, they will not feel any hurt anymore. They will not feel any pain anymore. Because we know that you have suffered for our pain. You paid for our pain, Jesus. And we thank you for that. We have the power to forgive because you have empowered us to forgive. Father, today, we just ask that, Lord, as you give us the liberty to walk in this life, especially to start the new year right, give us a new renewed heart. Give us a renewed heart to start a new, good new year, Lord. Father, we are going to end the year 2020 and we want to leave every unforgiveness behind. We want to leave every unforgiveness, any bitterness, any sin, any anger behind. We will forgive, release those who, those who do wrong to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy Spirit, we, can, we ask that you, you empower us, O oh God. Convict us, Lord, every time. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for speaking to us. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, we thank you and we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Thank you. All right. Before we all leave today, uh, Sister Cheng would like to say, tell us something. So please, I want you to uh, give your ear to her right now. Okay, Sister Cheng. Good morning. To give our best when times are good is understandable, but to give our best when times are bad and hard for us is what makes our worship before God distinct. First fruits offering is an important concept for us to understand, not only during this time when we raise our first fruits, nor is it only relevant when we are coming from a place of surplus or when there's no COVID, but the biblical principle of first fruits is an essential part of our worship to God. In Leviticus 23, verse 14, God reminded Moses that first fruits is a perpetual statute. This simply means that first fruits was to be continually given by all of God's children throughout the ages. As modern day Christians, first fruits reminds us that just as the Israelites were once slaves in Egypt, we were also once slaves to sin, and God rescued us by sending Jesus as our Savior. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20, Paul mentions that Jesus was God's first fruits, His one and only Son. God saw fit to give the first fruits of His love for us, the sacrificial gift of an only Son. Jesus gave His own life for us on the cross, he set an example for us of giving unconditionally and sacrificially. We walk in the footsteps of Christ when we give sacrificially, when we give unconditionally. The starting point for sacrificial giving is that everything we have is a gift from God. In gratitude of God's generous gift, we dedicate a portion of these gifts in furthering God's kingdom, in this case, through the lives and ministry of our senior pastors, our beloved Pastor Tony and Lily Lim. Perhaps the most important outcome of sacrificial giving is the impact it has on the giver. If you can give your gifts and not notice it, it isn't a sacrificial gift for it has no impact. The element of sacrifice is present 
when something about your life has to change in order for you to be able to give the gift. You reorder your priorities, you reconsider your values. And when you give the gift, you are reminded of the reasons why you have chosen to give. We give because God gave Jesus the best that humanity had to offer. He sacrificed everything so that we might have life. In like manner, we sacrifice the best we have for Him. As we give, we give up something of ourselves. Yes, we give up something of ourselves. When we give this way, we are transformed into becoming more like Jesus. I personally believe that when our motives are correct, this is when our worship becomes distinct. When we give sacrificially, our attention is focused on the true source of our security, Jesus. Knowing this truth and having the faith and obedience to live it out is what makes us distinct. The year 2020 is a trying time for all of us. Nobody is spared from COVID. Everybody is affected. It's easy to convince ourselves that we have nothing to give to God as we look at the year 2020. But what kind of hymn are we singing? What kind of statement are we declaring? What kind of testimony are we having? Sacrificial giving is an expression of our faith. After knowing, we profess, then we act on it. When we act on our faith, that's when we make the cut from mediocrity to distinction, from average to excellent. In Hebrews 11 verse 4, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God, a better offering, an excellent sacrifice than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Our first fruits offering to God is a demonstration that we value God above all else. We put him first in all things. We want to be Christ-like by giving our best sacrificially and unconditionally. Sacrifices that seem to be popular today, but thank God, for he brought us two extraordinary Christian disciples in our midst. The lives of Pastor Tony and Lily as missionaries to the Philippines certainly bear witness to the meaning and values of sacrificial giving. I can't end without citing the sheer audacity of Habakkuk's faith. In the face of defeat, despair, and an almost complete loss, he offers roaring praises, not roaring fears, but roaring praises to God. He could keep rejoicing though everything around him fails, the fields, the vineyards, the flocks, and the herds, because his joy was not in his crops and cattle, but his joy was in the Lord. This is faith and joy at their best. Those circumstances are at their worst. I can't help but consider what God can do in the life of the giver when one gives his best, though coming from a place of lack. This for me is what makes us gold. This for me is what makes us distinct. Thank you. At this point, um, can you request our ushers to just distribute the first fr fruits envelope? And please remember to bring this first fruits envelope together with your offering on January 3, 2020. We will collect the first fruits offering on the first Sunday service next year. That's on January 3, 2021. Okay, thank you.